The first major embargo for Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was lifted on July 7, and many different media sites and reviewers have gotten to discuss their first impressions. Hey everyone, it's Yggdrasil, and welcome back to another Xenoblade Chronicles 3 video. I was actually hoping to be doing a personal predictions and hopes video, but with the sudden embargo lift that came out of nowhere, I've decided to try and create a review roundup. I watched and read just about every single review of the game that was released so far, including ones with heavy spoiler content. This video is going to be split up into spoiler free and spoiler filled sections, so that way, if you want to know just a little bit more about the game without getting unwanted story information, I have got you covered. And don't worry, I will be letting you know in the video when we are going to hit spoiler content, and I will be sure to leave a timestamp down below as well. There is a Google Doc link in the description below of all the reviews so far with their respective links. I won't personally be using footage from some of them considering the information presented gets redundant after a while, and of course, if any of these reviewers somehow happened to see this vid from such a small channel and would like to have their footage removed from this video, please just message me and I will be happy to modify the video accordingly. Lastly, if you enjoyed anything of what I had to say in this video, and you felt it was good, please be sure to like and share it to your Xenoblade Mutuals and leave a comment down below letting me know what your thoughts are. As always, please feel free to subscribe to my channel and follow me on Twitter where I talk about many different games on an almost daily basis. All of that being said, we've got quite a few new things to discuss, so let's get right into it. Starting off our spoiler-free section, we'll be bringing up the system's menu, presented in a video by Shack News. You'll have the option to adjust system options when you first boot up a game, and either click on options directly or when you press new game. There are tabs to access options related to camera, audio, notifications, messages, display, brightness, and game. The camera controls display the usual, including inversion, reset speed, and positioning. There are also options to adjust how the camera should react when targeting an enemy and when starting up an interlink. The last notable feature here is the battle camera option which allows you to turn off or on animations that take control of the camera, like for example when you use a talent art like Noah's Overclock Buster, and the camera will pull away from everyone to focus on Noah. The audio menu will let you adjust the volume of distinct items from music to voices, and will allow you to adjust it to your preference. You can also change the audio between English and Japanese, which is confirmed to be preloaded onto the game, and you can even switch between them at any time in the game as well, barring I assume combat. The notifications menu will allow you to turn on or off notifications that would otherwise appear when something new is brought up. This includes tutorials and the newly revealed training drills. Think of these as virtual reality practice tutorials that you can undergo if you want a refresher and a tutorial is just not cutting it for you. And speaking of tutorials, I want to quickly bring up at this point that every single reviewer agreed with the fact that the tutorials in 3 were considerably more robust and well written as compared to those of 2. Even more stingy reviews like IGN's and GameSpot had to agree on the game having a much cleaner flow of information. Lastly, with notifications, there's another new feature listed here called Auto Sell, which can show notifications related to auto selling. I'm not quite sure if this means auto-selling as in some form of interactable market with NPCs, or if maybe we can just immediately sell items as we pick them up and we mark them that we don't really need them. It's just something we're going to have to see since no review really has covered it. The messages menu is up next, and again while there's nothing super fancy, I would like to point out here that we do have the option to select autoplay for both voiced and unvoiced text a nice quality of life feature that I'm sure some are going to appreciate. The display menu then allows players to hide specific character or enemy information. You'll also have the option to select between three position types for the minimap, which would otherwise be on the top right of the screen. Brightness is self-explanatory, just select what gradient you prefer. I personally tend to go one above the middle ground because I'm a blind blind man. <laughs> Lastly in system options is game. There are many various features here, including options to automatically activate quests and their objectives, targeting options for engaging the enemy, 
and even an auto battle feature that lets the AI take over all your party members. From what some reviews like RPG Site have stated, the AI tends to underperform as compared to if the player were controlling the characters themselves, but it's otherwise more than acceptable for letting them just do their own thing and get some small fights out of the way. With this feature, I do want to point out that auto battle will not work for boss fights or unique monster encounters. So then what happens when you press on beyond the menu, you've set up what you wanted, and you are good to go into the game? Well, following adjusting anything in the system's options, you will be asked what difficulty you would like to play the game on, and you are given three choices, easy, normal, or hard. To quote John Raritan, the director of Nintendo World Report, or the NWR for short, all difficulties are available from the get-go and can be swapped at any time, so long as you are not in the middle of a fight. John personally tested all three, although not too much in hard mode specifically, but he did go on to say that easy mode feels similar to the easier selections in both Definitive and 2, with enemies taking much more damage. Now, as someone with extensive knowledge of the Xenoblade games, as well as a strong understanding of how 3 will be playing, considering I've been analyzing everything, I'm personally going to be playing on the hard difficulty setting. And in case you pick a level that is a little too high or too low for your settings, don't worry, you can change the difficulty at any point in the game, barring when you are in combat. The game itself will also have three manual save files, as well as a quick save and auto save feature. This is a welcome return to having many save slots after its absence in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, where players would otherwise have had to create a new account on their Switch if they wanted to replay through the game and not do a new game plus run. Having both quick save and auto save features will also ensure that any of our progress is not randomly dropped if something should happen. As an example, the auto save feature itself is going to activate each and every time you skip travel. This is a very welcome addition because I can remember many times in both 1, X, and 2 where I've just played for hours and hours and somehow I forgot to save, and now all my progress is gone. Well, thankfully that hopefully won't be an issue with everything securing us in 3. Lastly in this section, John also confirmed that any cutscenes that you complete can be revisited in an event theater similar to that of 2's, although it is unclear that if it will show up on the menu, or if it will be something we can access in-game. Before we talk about the new things in the game, let's quickly run down just a handful of technical parameters. NWR claims that the game has remarkably high rendering resolution in both docked and handheld mode. That said, the game is set and locked to play at about 30 frames per second, but they noted that it is an extremely stable benchmark and that the game very rarely, if ever, dropped frames throughout their run in the review copy. NWR also observed at times extremely minor texture issues, although they said that it was very few and far between, and it took them slowing down to about a fifth of normal speed for them to be extremely noticeable for the average player to see. They also stated that it could be attributed to tessellation, a graphical feature that allows for patterns to more suitably render and give better resolution and detail. With that being said, the game holds and preserves a quality level of performance in both docked and handheld modes, the latter sacrificing only some minor visual detail, but otherwise is still extremely stable. You can see in NWR's comparison, they even used the in-game capture footage as a highlight to show just how well the game runs as compared to both the prior titles in handheld mode. All of this to say, the game has very good stability and performance, despite people's concerns with the Switch's aging hardware and limitations. Now let's move on to new overworld information. Every zone is but one of several that comprises a region. Each region is essentially a loading zone similar to that of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, but the catch here is that each region is several times larger than any of one's zones. As an example, the entirety of the prologue and chapter 1 will take place within the same region, but consists of the Milik Meadows, the Yazanza Plains where Colony 9 is located, and two other locations with new names I won't bring up here. And there could be even more zones that are also located within this region that will all load at the same time whenever you are in this specific loading zone. It may not be a true open world, but man oh man did they push the limits of what a loading zone can do to its absolute maximum. 
Most of the gameplay footage shown in these reviews that's safe to show in this section is from the Millic Meadows and Yazanza Plains, so let's start showing off some things from there. Game Explains footage is perfect to show off many of the new features that we've been shown. First off, take a look at the area where our group is traversing. This zone is called Villiera Hill in the Millic Meadows subzone. This is yet another nod to pre-existing zones from Xenoblade Chronicles 1 being in this game. We know that Millic Meadows takes inspiration from the Gar Plains, and sure enough, Villiera Hill was a known exact location set directly north of the Camos Guidepost back in the original game. A great thing to point out then with this footage is that item drops have been given a new light. You remember those older images of reddish orbs scattered around the open world, and we all thought that they were collection points like in 2? Well, it turns out that they are singular item spawns similar to those of 1 and X, but they have a few new twists. For one, as you approach the orb, it'll begin to fade and the item will show off what type the drop will be. As an example, items like ores will be denoted by crystals, plants by a twig with leaves, fossils, well, like fossils, and wood with lumber. Speaking of wood, puzzle tree wood is back, so uh-oh. Now, I do want to say that, as you may have noticed, item rarity is a thing in this game. Gold being the rarest, and purple looking to be a step below that. But that's not all. Monster drops are also a thing in this game, and like with overworld drops, these monster drops will also have designated rarities. Both overworld items and monster drops will be used for a variety of activities in this game. From cooking and crafting, to quest turn-ins and filling out requests for different NPCs in their Collectopedia cards, more on that a little bit later. I've yet to see other item colors aside from the uncolored common variant, the purple and the gold, so maybe we will just have three levels of rarity for simplicity's sake. When you pick up an item related to a quest, a quick note will appear in the upper middle of the screen telling you that you've collected an item related to a quest. The name of the quest and how much is still needed is displayed to the player for their convenience. If you are tracking a quest specifically, the item orb will also have a green punctuation mark placed over it. So even if you can't make out what it is just from looking at it, you can see both from the open world and also on your map exactly where the item you need is. Being able to see what item you need and where it spawned was a quality of life feature put into the definitive edition and sure will be a time saver in this game should it ever have any aggravatingly low spawn rate items. I'm looking at you, Black Liver Bean. Speaking of items in the overworld, there are also objects that you can interact with in the overworld that act very similarly to chests. We've gotten a glimpse at barrels out in the open that seem to act similar to the supply drop we saw in the clip of the Sierra Hovering Reefs. There's also something else new going on with items, well, not just them to be fair. On top of the usual random dialogue when loading into zones, reaching specific times of day, post-combat quotes and whatnot, characters also will have unique dialogue sometimes for when they collect new items, or even while you're exploring in the open world. It's a lovely addition that is going to let us hear and see more going on between members of our party and give the game just a little bit more life in such a bleak world. So I showed you the monster drops earlier, but let's talk about the monster that they came from. A level 11 crustip, but not just any ordinary crustacean mind you, it is an elite one, denoted by the blue wings around its level. On top of being stronger than your average enemy and having a good bit more health, they'll naturally award more to the party once they've been beaten. Defeating an elite monster surely deserves an elite bonus, and that's just what you're going to get if you commit to fighting one. In this particular case, the party got a 250% bonus to experience, a 300% bonus to their class points, and a 350% bonus to their earned gold. It's interesting to see that class points will have a higher value than base character experience. This could perhaps indicate that characters are intended to level through classes more quickly than their base character level. Also something interesting to point out here is that the kanji presented on screen translates to crushing. Just a weird redundancy considering it already says conquered, but hey, it looks cool so what do I care? The kanji on the left also is the exact same as the one Shulk uses when he activates Monado Smash in Smash Brothers, simply translating on its own into beat, attack, defeat. Huge thank you to Magpie on Twitter for helping with this translation. 
Fighting enemies one at a time is one thing, but well, one other way to go about fighting is through overworld skirmishes. Choosing to go in and participate with a skirmish by pressing ZR will bring up a quick prompt asking you which side you would like to assist, the level of the units in combat, how many are fighting on each side, and what rewards you will earn for assisting other sides in battle. It's interesting to see that a Nopon coin is shown this early in the game, despite the fact that I haven't seen any reviews really discussing their role just yet. It's also interesting to see that you won't always have the option to choose which side to aid in a skirmish, although it may make sense for specific story cases or interactions. Unfortunately, the footage in just about every one of these reviews was cut early, as the skirmishes ended, and I really would have loved to have seen how these skirmishes resolve. Now, your party's been out for a long time, getting their grubby little hands on everything in sight, fighting a bunch of enemies, so you know what, they're probably very dirty. That's right, I said dirty, and for whatever reason, it's an actual feature. As you spend more time in the overworld, your character will visually accumulate dirt on their clothing. I have no clue as if to being dirty can affect parameters like accuracy or evasion, there seems to be no indication that it can do that, at least this early on in the game anyway. So what'll you do when you get a little too dirty for your tastes? Why, you go to a campfire, sit on right down, and clean all your equipment. This feature can only be done around the campfire, so it's yet another reason to make sure you visit a campsite at every opportunity. While we're here at the campsite menu, let's also show off the level up feature. On top of having gorgeous new character portraits, each character can be selected, and have its level raised based on how much extra experience you've come across. If it works similarly to Expert Mode in One Definitive, any quests that you complete will not give you experience right away, but instead will store it in this menu. If you're having a difficult time in an area or you're against a wall in the story, simply go to a campsite and tap into any extra experience you have saved, and you can level up multiple times at once if you have enough saved to give you that edge that you need. However, I'd suggest you be very careful with this, as unlike with the preceding titles, you are not able to de-level yourself. If you over-level and then feel like the content just got a little too easy for your liking, I'm sorry but it just can't be undone unless you have a save file reserved. It's my earnest hope that de-leveling will be a new game plus feature, or introduced in a later patch. Alright, campsite's all cleared up, you got your items, you picked up some gold from fending off the local wildlife. A staple of any hustling and bustling hub is of course the NPCs that you all know and love. Some of them will just be something generic like Colony 9 Soldier or Shopkeep. But many NPCs will have unique names, which, when you talk to them for the very first time, will get added to the affinity chart. You can tell if you haven't talked to an NPC before, or if they have something new to tell you, if they have a gold comment bubble with a star icon. What's more, talking to an NPC with new dialogue will award a small amount of faction reputation, which is numerically denoted. Hubber's own affinity has always been a thing in the Chronicles games, but now we just have another hard confirmation that all instances of gaining or losing reputation in 3 will be displayed by a numerical value. Now on your stroll through the colony, say you've talked with everyone and you've even bought yourself that shiny new hat that you've always been saving up for. Well, go on into your character menu to equip it. That's right, we finally have our first views of the menu. Tabs that we have access to so far include characters, map, quests, item, and system. You can also see the flame clock of the nearest Ferranus, but I'm not quite sure what's going on there. The option to quick save is also accessible through the main menu, achieved by pressing the Y button. Now I'm going to assume that map, item, and system are all self-explanatory, and we really haven't seen any other footage of that, so let's go right on into the character tab. With our first look at this tab, we can see the usual things like their stats, what level they are, which classes that they are playing as, their actively set arts, but more importantly, we have our first look at what skills and accessories will be like. Sure enough, accessories are going to return in a style extremely similar to that of Xenoblade 2, being able to equip up to three accessories at once. Accessory slots will be unlocked as a character reaches a certain level requirement. Meanwhile, we can only have up to four skills active at a time. Given the size of each skill box, I also wouldn't be surprised if more of those are unlocked over time as well. 
Nothing was displayed showing that we can change our weapons, which makes sense considering that they seem to be tied to class, and gems don't seem to be accessible to use or equip at this point in the game, so we'll just have to take a rain check on how weapons work for the time being. One last thing with the character tab for now is that by pressing ZL we can see our full stats and by pressing ZR we will get something called build info. Not quite sure what this may be, but if I had to guess, maybe it's just a quick rundown of how we have our character set up. As for the quest menu, we can take a look at all the quests we've come across so far, what the recommended level is, and their rewards. Quests are listed based on if they relate to the story, our side quests, or are currently being tracked by the player. This menu is where we're also going to be getting a look at the Collectopedia cards that each unique NPC will give us. You can register which cards you want to accept through this menu, and cards that you have the requisite items to deliver will have a golden bag icon. Turning in requests from the Collectopedia is another way to earn some quick affinity for NPCs in a faction, and it doesn't seem that there's any restriction on how many times you can accept the turn in from the same requester. That being said, it seems that while Affinity and EXP rewards are going to be staying the same after a second turn in, unique rewards like accessories are only awarded once the first time you complete someone's request. And like with many other menus we've seen in the game, Nopon coins will be usable in some way for the Collectopedia card, not just quite sure how yet. With all the easy to streamline stuff talked about, I'm going to start jumping off from a bunch of other things I've not been able to pick up on. Starting us out will be the fact that we have the names of the English cast that will be voicing our motley band of fugitives. These names are in the opening cutscene of the game which is why I've opted to crop the image as much as possible. One key performance I'm surprised and happy to see is that Mio's voice actress, Miss Amy Fionn Edwards, I hope I said that correctly, happens to also voice the lovable Rani from Elden Ring. So it seems that a new requirement to be a contender for Game of the Year means having Miss Edwards perform, huh? Alright, joking aside, she has a very good role, and from the lines we've heard her deliver in the direct trailer, I'm very excited to hear more from her as well as from the rest of our cast's performances. On to a few combat things then. There are two notable pieces of information. The first is that we know that you can break Toppled Day's burst an enemy, but there's also some times where an opponent or a group of opponents can do the same to you. If your character is hit by an enemy attack that afflicts Daze, they will be uncontrollable for a few seconds. However, we now have footage that shows we can mash our control stick and buttons to try and break out of the Daze just a little bit faster. Speaking of other things in combat, there's something that's just dawned on a lot of people who've been looking at all the combat clips we've gotten since the game was announced, and that's the fact that there's no quick time events or QTEs in the game at all so far. This was a staple mechanic in all of the preceding games, so the choice to not have them here seems almost jarring. It's unclear if they may show up later in the game, but both RPG Site and NWR have confirmed that they did not appear for the entirety of their review sessions. Also, with regards to RPG Site, they showed us our first glimpse of options that we can select to bind onto our menu shortcuts. So far, they seem to lead into menus that we've seen, and I'm sure more are going to be added as we unlock more and more features throughout the game. The last bit of info that I want to talk about that is non-spoilery is that, according to Game Explain, each time you unlock a hero unit, you can select up to one playable unit to immediately learn and obtain that class. The rest of the playable cast must fight alongside that same hero unit in order to work towards unlocking the class for themselves. It's a bit of a strange way to go about it if you ask me, I'd personally rather they were just accessible for everyone, but you can't always get what you want. And that wraps up everything that I believe qualifies as non-spoiler information. If this was all you cared about learning, then here is the perfect time for you to stop and step away from the video, and thank you very much for watching. I'll give you a couple seconds so you can get the heck away from here, because spoilers are coming up next. So please, pay me no attention to me simply stalling for time, cause in 3, 2, 1, alright, it's here spoiler time, get ready. 
So now welcome one and all to the spoiler section, where I'm going to brief you in on the flow of the story that we've gotten thus far. And honestly, it's such a shame that I wasn't able to put out the predictions video that I was hoping to make yet, because I swear the very start of the game plays out just exactly as I'd imagined, barring a small handful of obviously important unforeseeable details. The July 7 embargo seems to have just been only for the prologue and the first chapter of the game. However, some reviewers have iterated that they were able to play up till the very start of Chapter 2. Regardless, only the prologue and Chapter 1 are what people really ended up discussing in these videos or shown footage of, so that is what I plan to talk about. Review channel Nintendo reported that it took about 15 hours for them to play through the game through the given story segments that they received on their very first run. And while I wouldn't exactly use a game reviewer's runtime as a good estimate, it should still be a decent way of just saying how much material the opening of the game has. And the opening itself caught a lot of attention from just about every reviewer, in that the premise, setting, and the opening fight of the game all felt reminiscent of and as a nod to Xenoblade Chronicles 1's opening, but with a much more dark undertone. In fact, they said the overall atmosphere of the game itself feels quite grim in comparison to both the settings of 1 and 2, despite both of those games dealing with multiple topics such as war and dwindling resources. The opening cutscene uses uncompromisingly dark media such as vehicles of war literally driving over the bodies of fallen enemies, just to highlight how unflinching and unforgiving the reality of this battle is. Even our own starting protagonist Noah is just not simply a youth yearning for adventure. He's been a capable soldier for several years, and he's seen and partaken in many battlefields, killing many opposing soldiers firsthand. So, well, let's begin right at the beginning! From GameSpot's footage, we have the exact first opening clip in the game. This review caught the ire of a lot of people, and for very good reason, because they started out their review by immediately showing what happened to the body of the Orion Titan. An orange marker appears over a chunk of the Titan before glowing emerald green. As the cone fades, a large swath is dissipated straight out of existence. This is perhaps the largest of the spoiled material that has come out so far. We know for sure now that Uriah was not cleaved in half by a great sword or some such as we were led to initially believe. What is interesting here is that we can potentially sort of make out the ruins of Fonza Mima in the back, and given that the Titan looks to have been dead for some time prior to this, it's hard to say if anyone was still even living there. It's not just Uriah, they also showed another clip of these kinds of circular radiuses taking out other chunks of land. It's important to note that as they fade into dark purplish matter, those appear incredibly alike to that of the fog beast matter. As for the color of the blast itself, many of the people I've spoken to have also seen this footage, and they've alluded to the green color being emerald, aka Mithra is involved in some way. But I'm not entirely sure myself. We can see from the direct trailer that when the council member began to forcefully extract life energy from the soldiers, the machine extracted red motes as expected, but there was also a small glint of emerald as well. It makes me personally lean on console involvement rather than Mithra. And don't forget, they also have a whole lot of dark purple motes going on about them as well. There's also another major spoilery scene in Nintendo's presentation, as they seem to show the merging of the two worlds. I'd like to additionally point out that there is some form of reflective structure in the top right of the screen, and I have absolutely no clue as to what it may be. There's also a cutscene early on that shows our young protagonist Noah looking around as the world freezes around him. In shock, Noah begins to run around in a panic. This is obviously the same scene that came from the release date trailer. I think it's quite clear to say that there are many more cutscenes with heavy implications than any of us really expected in these opening moments of the game. But I have no doubt many of these implications won't have all the light shed on them until much later on in the story. It's just something we'll have to see. After these starting cutscenes, we pan out into a big battle taking place in a new zone, the Everblight Plains. 
It is an incredibly barren wasteland ravaged from many years of skirmishes and conflict between Keves and Agnes. It is here that Noah begins his opening exposition of what it means to be alive in this world, living in order to fight and fighting in order to live. He tells us that all the soldiers are born believing that they are born from the country's queen, that they are their mother, and they are destined to serve her for the ten years of their existence. This adds greatly to the reasoning behind many of the soldiers' deepest hopes to return to their queen, their idolized motherly figure, if they live long enough and embrace their homecoming ceremony. This also adds more to the propaganda that I really want to see playing out between both factions. Now as Noah wraps up his introduction, we take control of him right in the middle of the fight itself. The soldiers of Colony 9 against the soldiers of Colony Sigma in a battle to the death. Joining our officer into the fray are Lance and Uni, as expected, along with a newly introduced character named Mwamba, a fellow Machina soldier who is their squad superior and a well-respected soldier among the members of Colony 9. Mwamba himself has just one month left in his final term before he can finally go back to the Queen and have his own homecoming ceremony. After the battle is concluded and Colony 9 is victorious, Noah performs his Offseer ceremony, and the group is set to head back to Colony 9 to rest and recuperate, and this is where we have our first bit of control to move around in the overworld just beyond being in the fight. Sure enough, we start with our Kevis trio, with Mwamba in tow, to round out a working group of four. Given his icon in the main menu, Mwamba looks to be a war medic like Valdi, which is a little bit strange because in the overworld UI, his portrait shows an attacker icon. Riku is also present, although he doesn't really participate alongside us, and just seems to be tagging along. As the group gets back to the colony and rests, I want to quickly point out this chat that Uni here has with a fellow soldier, talking about the recent battles. She says, you won't feed the flame clock unless we take him out with a blade. This implies that even killing a soldier is not enough to forcibly extract their life energy. They must be taken out with the tools of war specifically called blades. This suggests that life energy will not be extracted by a Pharaonis unless a blade series weapon deals the final blow. This also means that consuls and queens are the only exception to the rule since consuls can interact with the Pharaonis to forcibly extract life energy and the queens have their homecoming ceremony. While we're on the topic of the flame clocks, the Nintendo Life Review calls the life energy of a soldier their literal soul, while others call it soul flame. The flame clock itself is a device implanted onto the soldier's iris, so some of these reviews have been calling the flame clock an iris device. This makes a lot more sense with regards to what I brought up in the direct video I made, with about how the Lost Number characters were potentially not blinded when gouging out their flame clocks. Physiologically speaking, the iris of the eye doesn't provide vision, but is responsible for controlling the focus of objects within our field of view. By continuing to learn how to extract the flame clock from the iris of the eye, or by, perhaps, performing enough surgical procedures to deactivate it, this would still potentially allow the soldier in question to retain their eyesight. It then still remains to be seen if gouging out the flame clock disables dying after 10 terms, when the tattoo's color has faded, or if the two are related at all. Lastly, with the flame clock blade lost numbers mumbo jumbo for now, I wonder if this means lost number weaponry isn't specifically blade class weaponry. I can't imagine that lost number soldiers would continue to use weapons which could allow someone's soul to be extracted forcefully, but that's just a personal question we'll have to see. While taking some time to relax and clean up after the battle with Colony Sigma, our characters actually do bathe and clean up in the story as well. There's a unisex bath scene that takes place showing all of the soldiers, both male and female, getting washed up after a long day's work and just talking about what they went through. This highlights the fact that they are indeed just soldiers who have been taught nothing except things that relate to the war. Modesty is simply not an important factor to people who are only taught to fight and nothing else. In this scene, Noah reminisces on all of the people he's had to off-see in battle, including many of the people who he grew up with and fought for along in his own regiment. 
There's also some banter here between Uni and Lans, but none of the scene whatsoever evokes any of the semi-horny fanservice humor that was in 2. If anything, the topics discussed, as well as the non-sexually charged nature of the cutscene, just further illustrates the tones and themes that the game wants to get across to the player this early on. After resting, maybe the day later, the commander of Colony 9's forces gathers everyone together. What's notable here is that there are higher ranking soldiers who are also present, who are not normally stationed at Colony 9. The commander then announces that a new and important mission was just relegated to the colony, and that the queen has supplied them with special reinforcements as well. In the debrief, the mission seems to be the retrieval of a device heading towards the Alfeto Valley, bearing unusually large ether readings. As the commander finishes the debrief, a soldier asks if they can confirm that the target is Agnion, to which the commander responds that they're not quite sure, but they have also spotted Agnion soldiers nearby in search of retrieving the device as well. Sure enough, at the appointed time, our party meets up with the rest of the assigned soldiers on a ridge overlooking part of the valley, and you can note that Agnion troops are nearby as well. There's also a point between this time and learning of the special assignment that we will also get to play as Team Mio as her group is on the way to the Alfeto Valley as well. As the heavy weaponry of both factions fire at a cloaked invisible vessel, the vessel's cloaking system fails and begins to crash land into the valley below, ejecting a handful of war machines in response. The scene then turns into utter chaos from here, as with the ship being downed, the Kvesian and Ignine soldiers turn on one another and battle it out, with some of these unknown faction war machines thrown in the mix. Playing as Team Noah, our group makes their way through the thick of it all and comes into contact with the downed vehicle, as well as several Ignine soldiers. After fending off the enemy, Team Mio comes into full confrontation with Team Noah and they begin to duke it out. There's a pretty interesting scene thrown in here where Noah can't seem to land a hit on Mio, being the dodge tank that she is. But after watching how she fights for a few moments, he realizes that Mio's combat style takes inspiration from the Offseer's playstyle timing. The metronomic rhythm of how each beat plays in their themes is incorporated into the timings of Mio's attacks and reactions. What's more, as both Noah and Mio recognize that they are fellow Offseers, one of them makes a comment that with an Offseer present, the enemy is regarded as special forces, so it's a good way to show that people like Lanz and Uni have a little more status than common soldiers since they are paired up with Noah, an Offseer. The fighting between our two teams continues for a time until Guernica Vandom, who was piloting the vehicle, stumbles on out of the wreckage and attempts to stop both sides from fighting, before he himself is attacked by a mysterious fiend, our good old Mr. Wildride. I want to quickly also break away for a moment just to let you know that RPG site claims that Guernica Vandem is believed to be almost around 60 years of age. Anyway, the fiend begins absolutely thrashing members of both factions, and at one point he grabs a hold of Mwamba and another soldier and literally crushes them until they go limp. Rip my boy, he was just a few weeks away from retirement. Alright, anyway, the sheer power that Wild Ride possesses forces both Team Noah and Mio to roughly put aside their differences to try and confront him. Vanda manages to snap out of his stupor and reach out for the unusual ether charge device he was transporting, activating it and forcing everyone around him to experience interlinking. This is where Noah and Mio are fused together into their Ouroboros form and use the form's power to finally begin fending off Mr. Wild Ride. I want to point out here that this is an excellent time to show off that the game has seamless cutscene to battle transitions, a first for the series. After pushing back Wild Ride's offensive, he concedes and begins to withdraw from the battlefield, but not before leaving a parting gift. He fires an Ouroboros Infinity Symbol high into the sky, high enough that where every console member out in the field can visibly see it. This symbol, unbeknownst to our party, marks our group as being the enemies of both nations. It's here now that every person who fought alongside them has just now turned on them. It's here that Vandom explains what just happened to them, and it's here that he tells them that they need to work together to reach Swordmarch and learn the truth of the world and who the real enemy is.
And this is roughly where chapter 1 seems to end, at least according to the footage we've been shown so far. I want to point out that some of the reviews claimed that they were able to play the game up to the very start of chapter 2, where our team discusses how best to move on, and also unlocks features like class swapping. On top of that, other reviewers also corroborated that they were not able to switch out main characters until this point. Chain attacks are also unlocked shortly after, but that seems to be around the cutoff point for the review copy so far anyway. And with that, we are finally done talking about everything that I was able to round up from every single review we have seen so far for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Creating and working on this video was honestly a surprise, and I was a little worried to work on it given the potential for spoiler info, but I feel that it was more than worth it. If you stuck with me through everything in this video, well, thank you very much. But tell me, do you have your own thoughts on anything I brought up, or is there something that you think should be interpreted a little differently? Let me know in the comments below, but please be mindful if you choose to discuss anything I brought up in the spoiler section. You can also reach out to me on my Twitter where I am far more active on a daily basis. I plan to keep doing Xenoblade Chronicles videos, so if you enjoyed this one, please consider subscribing to my channel, where I'll be sure to make more videos about Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And also, please feel free to share this video with any mutuals that you think would be interested in what I presented. Thank you very much for your time, and as always, have a great day.